Welcome back to the Leaders in Lending podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Keltner, and I'm joined today by Richard Hunt, the president and CEO of the Consumer Bankers Association. We're talking a little bit about what's going on in DC and how it affects the banking industry. Richard, first of all, thank you for joining us. Yeah, you bet. You listened to your previous speaker. I feel a little embarrassed that I took the elevator to the 11th floor. Yeah, you know, they say some of the old time guys just took the, the stairs instead of the elevator. That's how they stayed in shape. So maybe we need to take a cue out of the old, old playbook. Yeah. Uh, so Richard, you've been CEO of the CBA for 12 years, if I've got that right. And before that, you were at SIFMA, which I think is a securities industry trade association. Uh, for those who are listening who are less familiar with uh, the trade associations in D.C. and the CBA in particular, can you just give us a little, like, what is a trade association? And specifically, what do you guys do at CBA and, and how do you work with the banking industry in general? Yeah, it's when people or companies of like interests come together to form a group. Uh, in Washington, D.C. to represent them on Capitol Hill and with the industry as well. I know there are some 10,000 trade associations in the world, and there are probably about 20 with financial services. Uh, We've been around since 1919. We have a little special niche, and that's called the consumer side of banking, not the investment New York side, not the commercial business side, large business, but the experience of the Retail Bankers Association uh, think about any experience you have walking to a branch. That's what we represent. Excellent. Well, that's, that's who we work with. So we're, we're glad to be having a conversation today. So I know you guys are in D.C. and we obviously just got through a pretty interesting election cycle. Uh, and I expect there'll be some changes on the horizon. What do you expect that this election cycle tells us about the future of banking? Well, I think we're at a transformation point and your company's right in the middle of it. Uh, Obviously, we just had an election. I have been in Washington, D.C. since uh, 1993. I worked on Capitol Hill for some 12 years. I know every nook and cranny of the Capitol. So it was very interesting, unfortunately, to watch what happened on January 6th with the rioters. Uh, So we have a new team in place in Washington, D.C. under the Biden administration. And this last year with the COVID situation, uh, which of course we still pray for each and everybody who's lost a family member and hope everybody is safe and healthy. But it has taught us quite a bit over the past year about the trends of the consumer themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, What has happened in the past year probably exacerbated what would have taken the banking industry probably 10 years when it comes to digital transformation and adoption. Now, I thought this began about five years ago when grandparents in order to talk to the grandkids, how to text or learn how to text. Grandkids don't want to talk anymore. They don't want to call anymore. They want to text. They don't want to even FaceTime anymore. So once grandparents started learning how to text with their grandkids, I knew for banking that could be all good. And I have been a big fan of what I call the FinTechs, the Silicon Valleys of the world. I thought they taught banking something we could not teach ourselves and that consumers, customers were ready to go digital. So I said how we represent the experience of the branch. Mm-hmm. Uh, we represent now the experience of the entire customer expectations. And my, have they changed. I now think some of the biggest banks in the country, the Bank of America's, the JP Morgan's, the Wells, they're now just as much of a fintech company as a true fintech, because all three of them individually spend about $10 billion per year, just on technology, 10 billion per year. Most banks in this country do not have $10 billion in assets. So I see a major transformation, major branch consolidation, finally, finally happening in this world, in this country, especially. We're, is it, you know, I, I, I hear the same thing from bankers that you do, which is kind of this digital transformation was on the mind, uh, but it was going to be a 10 year transformation. And now they're, they're trying to get it done in two. Where do you see them focusing on what's most important from that transformation? I mean, it's a little bit of the branch. I know COVID has exacerbated this with no branches are available. So things that used to be in the branch can't be in the branch anymore. But where do you really see them focusing on, you know, getting to first in terms of moving things into a more digital experience? Yeah, I think it has to go in a couple of different steps that will happen simultaneously. One, they have to get rid of branches. And I would not be surprised if we had uh, 30% less branches over the next three years. Now, usually we average about 2% consolidation of branches. 
But think about the recent mergers, SunTrust and um, it was now Truist, SunTrust and BB&T, consolidating branches there, BBVA and PNC. So you're seeing those four major banks becoming two, and with consolidation, they're going to get rid of branches. So I think you see that first and foremost. And then I think, finally, uh, you see the rest of the banks uh, being able to offer checking accounts online. I think mortgage applications across the board online and small businesses online as well. So I know to you, uh, that's the dinosaur era, but you have to keep in mind, we are the most heavily regulated industry in the country outside of probably nuclear industry. So every time we take a step, we have to be in full compliance with fair lending laws, community reinvestment laws, some of the laws that quite frankly, you don't have to partake in uh, like we do. So some fintechs have a head start on us, but many of our banks have now caught up. Many of you, like you guys did, are partnering with banks. So I don't think it's either or. I think it's a combination of fintechs learning with banks how to think about the 21st century customer. That's a great point. I'm curious your thoughts. You know, as you mentioned, the very largest banks have huge technology budgets and kind of a build here mentality. Um, but I'm curious how you see banks think about the fintech ecosystem and, you know, are they, are they competitors? Are they, are they friends? Are we kind of doing a build by partner and how that might've evolved as they're looking at accelerated timelines to get to the digital future that they see? Yeah. So about eight years ago, I kept on hearing how the fintechs were taking out the bank and the bank was the dinosaur and all the action uh, <laughs> was in Silicon Valley and California and Utah and Austin, Texas, and how the banks are about to become obsolete. So I said, all right, fine, fair. I went up to San Francisco and I visited three fintech companies. And then I went by Visa. And I visited with a guy named Ryan McInerney, who was at the time, uh, well, is president of Visa. He had been head of retail banking at Chase. And I sat down with Ryan and I said, Ryan, I got to tell you, I just don't see how fintechs are going to be profitable over a long term because you need the deposit base to make all these loans. And I said, 99%, I said 90% of Silicon Valley, I don't think we're gonna, we'll make it. Ryan looks at me and goes, Richard, you're part of the swamp. You've been in Washington too long. You're just dead wrong about the 90%. He thought 99% of fintechs would not be in existence 10 years from now. But the 1% that still would be in existence would complete and change the entire banking landscape. He just didn't know who the 1% was going to be. And you have seen over the last six years, many of the fintechs go under our partnership with banks. And I think that's where we are today. You're seeing fintechs partner with banks. Look, bankers do not have the wherewithal of fintech companies to think outside the box. Most bankers don't. So I think now we're entering into the pure partnership stage You've seen some of our banks buy technology and some invest it internally and do it themselves a lot because of the compliance factor. We have to know our partners as if they are a true member of the bank because of the regulatory arena we have. So I think we started off as pure competitors, envious of each other. Actually, banks were envious of you because you guys were doing things that we could not think of doing. How dare you talk to a customer, talk over uh, a chat, or do everything with AI, or do everything on a computer. No, that's not the way you do it. You're supposed to sit down with your banker eye to eye and talk. So we were envious of what you guys were doing. But now I think it's much more of a partnership. Now, there are some people, uh, fintechs, who are true competitors, who are trying to become a national bank charter. We're trying to make sure it's a level playing field. That's all we ask for. We will love to compete uh, with the new so-called non-banks as long as it is a level playing field. Yeah, so it's a great point. I, I'm curious too, you know, when we look at some of the fintechs and, and Upstart in particular, looking at not just digitizing, but bringing more advanced analytics, things like machine learning and AI into 
various parts of the bank, whether it's the marketing space, where I think banks have done this more traditionally, or, or credit underwriting is maybe the most interesting area, uh, fraud prevention, you know, KYC, AML stuff. But I know that there's lack of guidance or clarity in some instances around the regulatory regime or, or rules of the road, so to speak. And I'm curious if you see any motion towards helping banks better understand how they can, can and, and the guardrails they need to take advantage of those technologies. Yeah, I think we're getting there, but you're not going to have an answer by the end of this year. Uh, you have a brand new team in Washington at the CFPB, yep. at the OCC, soon to be at the FDIC and the Fed. Uh, Congress doesn't move too fast, and neither do regulators. They usually like they to take through time. They got a few other things on their books, too. They got a few things going they on. They do, but they also have to understand the world moves much faster than it used to, and everything is at warp speed. Uh, so I think we're going to get there very soon. AI is very interesting because of fair lending, uh, because of CRA. Uh, even that could be very subjective. How do you underwrite through AI? So it's a brand new territory and a brand new frontier for us all. Uh, but we're hoping the CFPB and the OCC especially pay a whole lot more attention to this so we can know what the rules of the road are. Now, I'm glad to hear that you're optimistic because we've certainly been engaged with those regulators. And it seems to me they all see the possibility and just want to make sure we've got the right guardrails in place to make sure these things are doing a good job and not a bad job. Yeah. And if any of you guys ever get bored in the fintech industry and want to come to Washington, D.C. and work with the regulator, we would love to have you. Because the one thing the regulators don't understand, uh, very few bankers and very few what I call tech savvy individuals. Uh, so I know you all would like to be a government bureaucrat in Washington. <laughs> so please come and help us. Richard, you may not believe this, but I get LinkedIn ads to become an OCC examiner all the time. And I'm not quite sure how they're targeting me, but I always find it pretty amusing that the OCC thinks I would be a good examiner. I'm not, I'm not convinced I have the skill set for that. They have uh, great benefits. Uh, yeah, I bet they do. Yeah. Um, so outside of that, what are the key policy changes that you see maybe on the horizon? I know there's a lot of talk about you know, where the new team may shift and what the focus would be. What, what are the things you're kind of looking at as the most likely places for, for changes in the constructs right now? Yeah, I would start with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB. It's something Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts started. I think it started with good intentions, uh, but it got overrun uh, by people who I think are anti-banking and anti-banking products. Uh, one of the several things we're looking at is small dollar liquidity needs. We all know that some 50% of all Americans don't have enough money in their checking account to take care of a $500 financial emergency. Now think about that. In this country, half the population don't have enough money in their checking account. And that's where we stepped up in the banking industry. You guys are doing that with your unsecured products to help people meet that need. I wish that product uh, did not have to be in existence. I wish everybody had enough money to pay their bills each and every month. That's not reality. That's fantasy land. And so we're hoping that our banks, uh, some, some 10,000 banks, can get back in here and help people with short-term liquidity needs. I remember Dick Bove, a uh, stock analyst uh, who grew up in the New York uh, Bronx area. Uh, when he was growing up, his parents needed money and they couldn't go to a bank. Uh, they couldn't go to a credit union. They went to the mafia, literally the mafia. So the mafia is really not that ancient. And he had to get money. And he's thinking today, where do you go for short-term money? If you can't go to a bank or a fintech and you've exhausted your credit card, you're going to go to a payday lender or even worse, an online lender. And that's going to be very, very high interest rates. And you get in this mountain of debt and a debt trap and everything else. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things we're going to be trying to get the Biden administration to understand the plight of everyday America and make sure the banks or a heavily regulated entity have the ability to offer these products. The government got rid of this product in 2014, and so many people were mad at us because it was a very popular product. It had a lot of safeguards, safe rails to it as well, and we're hoping we can get back into that one. Excellent. And what are your other priorities as a CBA for this year? I mean, I'm curious what your members are asking you to focus on. I know, I know I asked what the government's going to do, which is kind of the external side, but what, what are your priorities in terms of the areas and things you're pushing on outside of the, the small dollar and, and kind of short-term liquidity needs? Yeah, we got a short, uh, several initiatives. One is uh, something you may have heard of, the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP. Mm -hmm. 
Our CBA membership has been front and center since the last March, helping some 5 million small businesses get back on their feet. Uh, our banks move heaven and earth uh, to help get these programs out. Our brand new government program that was created in about eight days. We're back in the middle of another draw now uh, to help people out. That's one. I tell you another initiative uh, that we're not going to just talk about it, but do something about it. And that's racial equality. Uh, obviously, you know what all happened during the summer. Uh, banking industry is has been historically made up of white guys. And we have to double down on our efforts to encourage those with diverse backgrounds to be part of the banking system because they are America as well as you see the demographics continue to change. But it's yep. time to stop talking about it and time to start acting uh, about it. I will tell you this. I think the banking industry has done an extremely good job recruiting, promoting uh, women. But we missed the boat, I think, on people of color. And shame on us. So that's going to be a major priority for us. Uh, also helping get this economy moving. So with the PPP, racial yep. diversity as well. We know that once all the vaccines are distributed, keep your fingers crossed, we're doing better, I hope, yep. that there is going to be a pent-up demand, which means a lot of people are going to be asking for loans. And we have to be a safeguard that we do not go back to 2005, 2006, and seven and provide mortgages to people who do not deserve it. When I say don't deserve it, they don't have the credit quality to do it. So we see a big boom happening in this country sometime after this summer. And sometimes in the banking industry, it's better to make sure we protect people instead of just pushing loans and products their way and making sure they can actually afford to pay their bills and not go back to the wild, wild west of uh, the early 2000s. Yeah, that's certainly a thing we focus on as well. And I think an area where we see a lot of opportunity for improvements in underwriting around real affordability, uh, kind of looking at cash flow and, and different kinds of metrics that can that can help lenders understand better uh, what the real capability to repay is for borrowers, which is really a kind of a critical thing to make sure you're lending not just a lot, but lending safely into people who can really afford it. So my last question for you, uh, and then we can see if anybody else has questions, but is, you know, as a, as a fintech that has chosen the partner with bank route and not the compete or uh, become a bank through the OCC charter or other ways, you know, what's your advice on uh, what we can do to be a good partner to the banks that are, that are members of the CBA. Cause I think that's, we'd like to do that, but we definitely come from the techno technology background. We're not bankers for the most part uh, here at Upstart. And we, we'd love to understand a little bit your advice for FinTechs looking to partner with banks. How do you go about it? What are they looking for from a partner and, and what can we do to set ourselves up to be a good partner to banks? So I would say there are two items I would look at. Uh, first and foremost, the boring one, compliance. <laughs> uh, we are scared to death of our regulators in Washington, D.C. So before a bank wants to partner with a fintech, they have to make sure the fintech has one hell of a compliance department and cares about compliance. It has to be in your DNA. And I don't like lawyers. I'll be the first to tell you. I've never seen a group of people say no so many times on a daily basis but you need them. Yep. They have to keep you out of trouble. So you better double down on your compliance because if we sniff anything out of order, we're gone. Banks are gone in a heartbeat. And quite frankly, there are a lot of you out there right now. So the competition uh, is pretty fierce. Number two, you got to tell banks something they don't know. Where is the consumer going? We're going to have our conference up here pretty soon. And we're going to have a bunch of panelists who are going to tell us what is real and what is not. What habits have changed from the customer since last March 11th? And what is going to go back? What will revert? Mm -hmm. And what is permanent and a systemic change? So that's the great value I think you can add. And I, if you think this is true, is the technological divide over? Is there a difference in the acceptance of technology among teenagers to boomers to the older generation? I think it's pretty well done. Keep in mind, from birth to death, from birth to death, you can have the same telephone number and same bank with remote deposit capture and everything else. And yes, I'll be the first one to tell you, our banks were slow out of the gate when it came to technology but you guys had an advantage and you took advantage of it. And I applaud you for that. 
We had our head down after the 2009 crisis fixing our ship. We had a lot of cracks in our ship and we had to catch up. So anything you do can do to help banks catch up to your world would be most helpful. Richard, I, I agree. And I'll just say, I think one thing that was underappreciated in Silicon Valley was the, the advantages and benefits and actually capabilities that banks had. I think there was a, a lack of appreciation for what banks were bringing to the table. And, and we think the best future is kind of bringing the best of the worlds together and, and you know, taking advantage of what banks do well. And, yeah, and what, retail banking is not easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. It's hard. Uh, scraping pennies out of a loan and complying with the regulatory burden. Uh, Goldman Sachs is now trying to get into the retail bank and they just made an announcement. They're not going to make money for years. And everybody thinks Goldman Sachs is the greatest thing since sliced bread and they know how to make money. Total B, you know what else? It's hard. It's tough. It's tough business. Well, I appreciate your conversation today. This was a great conversation. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, and, and thanks so much for your time. Yeah, look, again, you guys want to become a regulator? Come on to Washington, D.C. We've got a place for you. All right. So we'll, we'll end with a call for applications for upstarters and other listeners of the podcast who'd like to become regulators. Uh, yeah. So thanks for your time. Thank you. You bet.